Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Urbanism by Chance by Urban Avenues. My name is Jamie Truffin. I'll be your host. And today we have a guest, Whitney Mayfield. She is a planner, awesome person. Uh, Whitney, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, thank you so much. As Jamie said, my name is Whitney Mayfield. I was born and raised in the East Valley of Arizona. And uh, you know what? I'm not being an urbanist. Um, I'm an avid hiker, um, adventurer, and an eldest daughter. Awesome. So you are a planner. And I have a question for that with the role of cities. And what role do you think cities have in playing and shaping your personal and professional life? Well, I I love to travel. And I'm always amazed by the character of a city, just like culture and arts and things of that sort. And I always look especially at like the amenities that a city has to offer. And I'll just like pay attention to the different patterns that I see and just like ask a lot of questions. I get pretty curious about it. And then in my professional life, I work in the public sector. <laughs> Decided to start there because new to planning, uh, this is would be kind of like my second my second job in planning. And I felt like uh, working in the public sector would give me a well-rounded idea of what it means to be a planner. I think our cities are just so fascinating. Like when you start looking into every everything from like waste management. I, I think waste management is a really cool field in the public sector of just like how... No way. I love waste management. Like that was, that was actually like kind of one of my side ideas of like, okay, if I'm not going to be a planner, like I would, I'm so interested in waste management, even though it's not one of our sexiest jobs out there. No, it's hard to find a landfill. Like you can't just go and make a new landfill. It, it is very tough to do because yeah. especially with the water table and contaminants and yeah, making you wanna layers. Be, you want to be careful about that. Yeah. Ugh. Takes a when depending whether whether you do like a recycling facility or a landfill, you're gonna require require a lot of water. Yeah. Uh, w- whatever way you do, you'd be surprised like what comes out of it. And I actually am like dying to um tour Phoenix. I think the city of Phoenix it's called their like transfer station. I know it's somewhere near Levine, and I'm dying to to go visit that. And then they have like a, p- a plastic recycling facility. I would also love to tour that. They do have the, I've been to the, I did a tour of the North Phoenix one. It is, it is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky you. (laughs) I'm going to have to check that out. What was the happiest moment you've experienced while exploring a new city? Was there something in that moment that clicked and made you realize what it means to truly feel happy in an urban environment? I have two mentions. I'll start with uh, Seattle. So the summer before I actually started grad school, I got to spend some time in Seattle and I was staying right off of the water, like near Pike's Place, uh, Pike's Marketplace. I remember just like being able to walk everywhere. But one of the things that I thought was so cute and I'd like never seen because, well, I'm, I don't know. I don't think I'd seen it in other cities yet, but I was so impressed by their bike infrastructure and how like they had the protected bike lanes. But they had these cute little, uh, what were they? They were like traffic signals that were made for bikes. And they had like a bike symbol that was in them. And it was so cute. But I think I liked the most that it was protected. And just like the many modes of transit that you got there. And then in Vancouver, I was very impressed with my ability to get everywhere on the the bus. We got all the way up to the mountains in the bus. We went to uh, Lynn Canyon. And it's just like, it's right in the mountains. And it was such a beautiful park. They had a waterfall and everything. And all by the bus, I I was impressed on. Honestly. I think City Nerd actually just recently did a video, and I think Vancouver was number one, or it was in the top ten list for sure. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. The the transit in the Pacific Northwest, I'd say uh, Seattle and Vancouver for sure, they're doing a great job. In, in- Surprisingly, in Phoenix, too, the buses are great. It's just some of them can just be rerouted very slightly, and it would bring you right to the trailhead. Yeah, yeah, that is true. And now with the Valley Metro extension, the light rail extension that's going into the south side, I think it is stops like right about at uh, Central. And I think 7th Avenue or 7th Street is kind of like where you get into the mountain. So you're pretty close. We did. um, And I I think this was a unique way to incorporate hiking and transit is a very famous mountain in Phoenix is known as Camelback Mountain. Yeah, I may or may have not hiked that barefoot with watermelon. Oh, my that's another story. Wow. Okay, I got to hear so, that. <laughs> but anyway, so we took the bus there, and because the mountain, it's a wide mountain, yeah. so we actually took one bus on one side, hiked it as a group, and then came down the other side, so we could we didn't have to reroute wow. all the way back. We were able to cross the entire mountain and come back on another bus. Wow, that's a pretty long one, and that's impressive, because if you if you don't know, and if you've never hiked Camelback, it's very steep, and even on, even on the um, easier trail, I think it's like Choya. Mm-hmm. Choya is the so-called easier one, and they're both pretty steep, so that's a pretty 
pretty long. That one height. just feels like it never ends. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy, but it's just it just feels like it keeps going on and on. It just keeps going up and up and up, but it's a beautiful one. <laughs> While traveling and enjoying new cities, do you start to recognize the importance of infrastructure and question the built environment of the city you live in? Does it inspire a passion for change in your own city? And I think your Vancouver example kind of touched a little bit on this. Indianapolis is like a second home to me, and I recently just came back from Indianapolis. And one of the things that I've started to pick up on is that in the Midwest, and I'll say Ohio and Indianapolis or Columbus area of Ohio and Indianapolis area, I'm noticing like a pattern of missing sidewalks outside of the suburban suburban like neighborhoods. One of the things that particularly bothered me about the example I'm about to bring up is that my parents live, I'd say like a five minute walk like literally right across the street from a park that's by their neighborhood. And um, there will be like a picture that I'll include. But like, you know, as you have to walk to this park, that's five minutes. There are no sidewalks. You have to kind of walk in the shoulder part of the road. And, you know, I wanted to take my nieces and nephews there, but without sidewalks, it makes it really unsafe. And I mean, frankly, it's unsafe for me. But I don't know. I just I thought about that in the context of like accessibility and like what problems that that brings and just the overall problems of just like lack of infrastructure that makes it safe for people to want to choose that option. And so instead, um, if you're wanting to take the kids to the park, you might have to opt for driving a car there when it's just a five minute walk. So I picked up a uh, on a little bit of that as a pattern and think a lot about accessibility issues when it comes to that. Yeah. And, you know, I always hear when people talk about accessibility, it's like, oh, but there's a handicapped parking spot. And if you've never been in a wheelchair and I've been in a wheelchair and I remember this, this I was trying to go to a, tra a Trader Joe's. I was there was a bunch of handicapped parking spot, but there was no there was a sidewalk from the parking spaces. But to actually get into the Trader Joe's in the parking lot, there was actually no sidewalks like whatsoever. It was oh. near the Arrowhead Mall, actually, that 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 Trader it's, Joe's that's right there. Uh, that makes it really hard. It's, yeah, it's like kind of incomplete in a way. It's and it almost feels like maybe the development was kind of doing the bare minimum to kind of meet those standards, because if you think about it, it's supposed to connect so that the person can get, you know, from the vehicle or however way that they access it, but just like complete access to the store. And it, it makes it hard in that circumstance. And some of those parking lots, it's like it's so bad. You can't even just park in one spot and go to another. You have to, like, get back in the car to go to another part of the parking lot. Yeah. And it kind of honestly, it sounds like it defeats the purpose and it just isn't efficient in that way. Last year, while traveling to Philadelphia, you were about to order a lift, but decided to take <laughs> SEPTA instead. Can you talk a little about a little bit about that decision and what your thoughts were at the time, and did you feel more connected in a new city when you took transit? Yeah, last year, or yeah, when I took that trip, honestly, it was the first time I had been to the East Coast, and I really just wanted to soak up everything. And I thought, like, yeah, it would be a lot easier if I just like ordered a lift or whatever the case might be. But I decided to take transit just because, like, I think that as planners, it's important for us to walk the walk and to use the transit. And I honestly just wanted to see like how easy or hard it was, and it was so easy. I just downloaded the app ahead of time, and you can even on your like Apple Maps or your Google Maps, you can use transit, and it'll even tell you like what stops to get off at so you know you get the help from our regular apps but then you it was really simple to watch and I just felt like as a passenger in on the SEPTA is what they call it it just just reminded me to like pay attention to my surroundings and just like allowed me the opportunity to just like look out the window and really take it all in because when you get in a lift it's easy to just like bury your head in your phone and not really pay too much attention and sometimes you might look out the window but I feel like uh, riding transit is a good way to like also orient yourself and like learn the area a little bit and a lot of the stations like they don't just put stations in random areas a lot of them have high importance so usually when you're going to a stop it like sometimes will tell you like hey this is the museum of yep. something or this is some importance exactly that and uh again those are just ways that you can orient yourself and remember like oh i remember i passed the museum on my way to where it is that i'm supposed to go and oftentimes they are also like labeled by whatever it is that they're by so in this case the convention center and i feel like the more often you do it too it's just you get such a sense of direction in a new city yep like when i go to a new city even if i don't understand the language or anything about the city or country i can go into a new city and just taking transit, if they designed it right, you can really figure it out. Like South Korea, I was taking transit everywhere. Couldn't read any of the sides, but I could figure out where I was going. And some of those nights, I really needed to make sure I was getting home. And that's a complete other language. That's, so that's complete pretty impressive. culture language. Honestly, I've heard great things about a, um, a lot of like the Asian countries, transit, especially Japan, like very efficient mm -hmm. in the way that they, they build their transit and how robust and like connected it is. 
Even so, the the rural parts too, like have really great connections with. Yeah, and see, and that's like that's an honorable mention right there. Like it's one thing to be connected in like the more urbanized areas when you can get out to places like uh, Lynn Canyon in Vancouver or the rural parts of South Korea, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, South Korea. I mean, I think that just those are like very honorable mentions and uh, things that we hope to continue to see. All right, Transit Ahoy. How has using public transit inspire any new ideas or passions for improving transit option in your own city? If so, what changes would you like to see? I live in the city of Tempe. I like their transit. I started to actually think about just like how connected it was with the orbit or if you, um, I love I love the orbit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love and there's so many other ideas that I'm actually going to bring out too. I like the orbit because it's free and again, I think it helps with the accessibility part of the conversation that we were having. I like that it's available in all parts in Tempe, not just like the downtown areas. I think that's kind of like a common theme that you see. Um, it's connected and then it also connects you to Valley Metro and then, you know, the light rail and the bus and all of that. I did see something like that that was similar in uh, Phoenix. Like as a kid, I rode what was called the Alex bus and it was kind of like the Orbit bus and it just kind of got you all around. So I'd love to see like more of those options in areas that need it. And then a really cool <laughs> mention that I want to bring up is uh, the Fred. It was like like a circulator but it was like an on-demand circulator and this is in San Diego when um and when I was in grad school we went to San Diego for a conference and I got to ride the Fred and like you can order it just like a lift and it was free and it was EV that was in certain areas of uh, San Diego and it was it was pretty helpful yeah and especially with I'm gonna go back to the orbit shuttles because I love them they're just <laughs> yeah. I, like they're not huge they're not full buses they're maybe like half the size of a of a full-size bus yeah but they they're very nimble they can move around really quickly and just uh when i lived in tempe i I actually used them a lot to get to the light rail station and you would see like everyone on it you would see kids using it a lot of the skateboard kids will use it to get around (laughs) yeah that's actually funny because as kids um i also grew up in tempe i remember riding the orbit all the time with like my cousins and everything so it was just now that like thinking back at it, it's like, oh, that's really kind of, I don't know, exciting to like have that feeling of a little bit of independency and just being able to get around the city and see different parts. Do you think cities with robust public transportation systems create a stronger sense of belonging for newcomers or visitors? Why or why not? And I I love that example you just gave a second ago with your cousins, and I feel like this kind of relates to it. Yeah, it, it does. I think it can bring a sense of like belonging for newcomers because once they after they've like used it a little bit, then they kind of get to, like I said, I believe that transit helps uh, folks orient themselves to the city because they have to pay attention to everything that's um, around them as they're like passing things up to get to their destination. And I think once they've used this, like used that transit system a couple times, then they start to orient themselves and they kind of feel a little bit of belonging to the city because it's not so foreign to them. And then, you know, obviously for the folks that live there, like it, it creates a sense of like ownership or like that they're a part of the city because, you know, they know how to get around and use these systems. It does kind of create a sense of identity for a city. Like if I say the L, right? You're going to know Chicago or the exactly. Loop, you know. It does create that sense of identity. Or like uh for an example, before I had a car, I was riding on uh, the Valley Metro and kind of just I was able to be able to tell you like exactly which route and knowing exactly where I'm going and again just being able to orient myself and know a uh, different direction. What have been some of your most memorable experiences? while using public transit, and how did those moments shape your view of the city? I'd say my most memorable experience, besides the one in Vancouver, which I really enjoyed, in Dallas, I got to ride this really cute trolley car, and it, again, had its own orbit around the city, but it just went around really cool areas of the city, and one of them specifically I liked seeing and riding over was Clyde Warren Park, and Clyde Warren Park is actually like a really cool public and private partnership where there's like a park that's right over the highway, and it just, I don't know, besides that, it just took you to really nice parts of Dallas that, you know, you can just get off and explore and then hop back on and you're back at uh, your destination. Now that like you said that, I'm like thinking about the time I went to Denver and I believe where the REI is or I think it's REI. Yeah. I've been there is there. a trolley right there, too. Yeah. I've been, I love Denver, too. I, I, I rode that one because I was like, and that one was a, a unique experience because getting there, we didn't we didn't drive there or anything. We were walking around downtown Denver and they had like a canal that you can go yeah. through. 
Yeah. And it just, people love that sense of exploration in the, in the city. And we stumbled upon that. We didn't look anything up. It just happened to come. Yeah, that's the best part. And I think that was the same for me. I didn't know that there was a trolley car. I just happened to have been told about uh, Clyde Warren Park. And I was going just to check this out because I thought it was so cool that there was a park over a highway. And then the trolley car came by and I was like, oh, I want to jump on that. <laughs> I want to see like where that will take me. And it just, you know, showed me really like artsy parts of town and just really beautiful infrastructure. So I love that. You initially study media analysis before shifting to sustainability. You took a class focused on urban resiliency. How did that transition shape your perspective on cities and their ability to adapt to change? When I took that class, it really opened my eyes to like the different vulnerabilities that a city has. You think like when we you often think about like vulnerabilities when it comes to planning a city, you just kind of think of like the more practical uses. But when I learned about that concept, it really just made sense to build cities in a resilient way and maybe not always maybe the less cost efficient way because of the risk. Ultimately, like for an example, if we live in a city where it's prone to earthquakes, you know, you don't want to just try to turn out development that is going to be a lot more cost efficient, but then ultimately might topple. Made sense to me to build cities in a more resilient way um, so that it's able to bounce back and just like maintain itself. And again, you know, these cities are for people and you don't want a, a city that has like crumbling infrastructure or just any kind of issues like that because that causes issues down the line. And putting debt to the next generation. I think that's another huge issue I've been yeah. Outside of other issues that come with like the vulnerabilities, it does like if we're looking at it from like an economic standpoint, it does end up being more cost effective in the long run. Children are often overlooked in the urban planning process. How out of place do you think that children's needs are in current city planning? And have you had any experience with youth engagement that you can share? I definitely think that children are excluded from the planning process. And I don't I think it's a lot of it is because we as adults kind of assume that children don't really understand. They're not really connecting the concepts. I actually had the exact opposite experience in a project that I did in grad school with Sketch, by the way. Hello. <laughs> So we did this really fun project where we created a, some curriculum to engage the youth of the city of Phoenix on what they like to see. And in that discussion, we talked about transportation and we forget that, you know, adults are the, aren't the only people that are using transportation or commuting by foot. A lot of the times it is kids because kids can't get behind the wheel. And so we have to think about like when we're planning for transportation, it's, we have to think about like the kids and the fact that like they're walking these streets and they want to feel safe. Beyond that, it just when I mentioned the accessibility issue with the lack of sidewalks, like you can get a sense that some of the development doesn't actually prioritize people. And so you can bet that children aren't uh, wildly underrepresented in the planning process. And again, we're creating these cities for, you know, the people and these little people are a part of the city and who will become the adults. And, yeah. you know, it doesn't feel like they get a chance to really be involved until they're much older like six even like they don't even get to experience what the city is for them until they're 16 and can drive really yeah and that's kind of that's a huge chunk of your life getting them involved in these processes will also introduce these professions to them um a lot of the times when you talk to people about what urban planning is they don't know usually i'll use the term city planning because you know then they'll get a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about but if we do get them involved not only because we're planning the cities for people and the youth are a part of the people that we're planning the cities for but it's also to let them know of this profession and maybe they might be interested and maybe they're interested, you know, kids are really creative and they love building the cities and the games that we created for our project. They love being able to build their city. So, you know, you introduce them to uh, planning and we might get a lot more planners in the field. And I think something super interesting that just where our mindset is with planning and how it feels like it's exclusive for just older people, which it's not. Everyone should be part of the planning process. Right. So last week was a week without driving, which it's a challenge to city officials and planners and decision makers. To go out and spend a week without driving. Yeah. To try to go an entire week without driving. Right. And the idea is behind it is because 30% of the population in America, on average, give or take some states, can't drive. When I told someone this the other week, and someone was like, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't believe those numbers. And I was like, that's including, like, children. Yeah. Like, people under 16 cannot drive. That is... Yeah. Part of our population. They're and some people just choose not to drive. Mm -hmm. Driving is kind of scary sometimes. People drive fast, and yes. it can be a little intimidating. I, and our numbers are not going down in the in the safety aspect. Yeah, and so I think, again, that all just speaks to like the importance of balanced investment in transportation, not just one mode of transportation, but all modes so that others can feel safe to opt into other modes of transit. I mean, if we get like balanced investment in transportation, then you know, maybe we can find more reliable transit systems that people can use on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe it won't just be a week maybe it'll be a month 
Yeah, and even if you like driving, it's like still good to every once in a while not drive and yeah. r- not have wear and tear on your car. Yeah, and especially with like the businesses that are like right off of transit. I mean, it just it's so much more easier in that way. Uh, I've had some friends. They're they're car enthusiasts. They love cars, but they love taking transit still, and they're big advocates for it because a sometimes they don't want to put wear and tear on the car that they're yeah. building. And yeah. also, less cars on the road for them is what they want. Exactly. I think, uh, honestly, less wear and tear was, like, the best part of it. You know, being able to work uh, from home during the pandemic is, like, not putting so much on it and just being able to, like, walk around my neighborhood and, yeah, just be really close to home. It, it's hard to conceptualize the actual, like, wear and tear because it's, it's not, like, a number that just appears. Like, it, you really have to see it over time and add up the numbers. Yeah. Your explorations seem to connect you with a wide variety of people and places. How has your urbanism journey helped you build connections, both personally and professionally? I'd honestly like to give like a huge shout out to um, a lot of my career advisors and professors in grad school because they were a great help in connecting me actually to my first internship, a professor that was great enough to do that. And I had another professor that connected me to another planner that just let me pick their brains about the transit sector of of urban planning and just ask different questions about like what to expect. So a huge part of that just goes to grad school. That was, it's been always really nice. And then just working in the public sector, just working in a job in general, um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to go to conferences. And so conferences are a huge part of just like building my connections to different people. Just love getting together at concerts and just kind of talking about urban planning things and just like the different problems and like solutions that we're seeing all over. And you originally weren't going into urban planning. You were in a meeting with my former employer, Downtown (laughs) Phoenix, Inc., there was a meeting presentation, yeah. and that's kind of what got you started. So just attending yeah. things, you might not know. You might be an urban planner inside, and you just don't know it. Yeah, so that actually like another big introduction to planning. So my background, just to kind of go back to like exactly where I came from, most of my jobs were in customer-facing um, environments. I was in customer service, working in insurance. I got my bachelor's, both of my degrees at ASU. Woo-hoo, go Sun Devils. Got both of my degrees in, at ASU. My bachelor's in communications with a minor in sustainability, and sustainability is what led me there, but ultimately I kept getting jobs in customer service. Leading back to the point, I was working at a fintech startup downtown, and Downtown Phoenix Incorporated organization came in, and they did a presentation on just like the downtown area, a lot of its history. I had no idea that we had all kinds of like districts, like warehouse district and the financial district, and like a lot of the adaptive reuse projects that they were trying to do with existing buildings, and I was fascinated by that. I was not happy <laughs> I was working at at the time and I immediately was asking like hey do you guys have jobs but at the time I didn't know that it was urbanism I just knew that I was interested in like the city history and um, just like I guess more so community development which hence why I became a planner. Those type of organizations are very interesting they are considered a nonprofit, and many cities have them they call them business improvement district enhanced municipal service district mm-hmm. there's tons of names each city will do differently but it is a, it's a really unique program and it really helps a downtown area out. Yeah. I thought it was great. I think their mission was uh, hospitality, but for me, it served uh, an educational purpose for me, and I really enjoyed it. What role do you think cities play in fostering a sense of belonging and community for newcomers, and how can cities better embrace and support this? I think cities play a crucial part because they offer diverse social, cultural, and professional experiences that can help people connect and integrate. And I think cities can support this through community and private partnerships, kind of like the one that I mentioned with uh, Clyde Davis Park in Dallas, and then enhancing access for all, staying in those public spaces to create some third spaces for folks, and then using resources like tech technology to promote the use of those spaces so again qr codes are like a popular thing and obviously social media and just getting creative about how you reach your community a uh, third spaces which is you know it's not work and it's not home it's that middle in between space it could be like a library something that's low cost yeah. to participate in and even attending events i think events yeah. i don't know if you can consider events third spaces but events are usually hosted in third places especially like a free event. Yeah, I I feel like because of like when you were mentioning earlier, the investment in like a lot of the highways and then the adjacent uses being like single family, like one of the things I keep asking is like outside of, you know, we we need things to do outside of just like home and then parts of the city that are used for a car and then used for business. So we do need those those third spaces and just creating spaces for people to foster community in that way. I did a walk. I hosted a, it was for Jane Jacobs, who was an urbanist. She wrote the book, Life and Death of Great American Cities. If you don't know who that is, I recommend looking up the book, Life and Death of Great American Cities. 
yearly she has a walk in her honor. It's like the second week of May or first weekend of May. Yeah. Some Sometime around that time. And you host the walk showing off your community. And I did one around Hans Park, which is a park that was built over a highway. They Technically, it's like 18 bridges in one. Yeah. They were originally going to do like a double helix coil. It was, it was some Robert Moses stuff. Really? Yeah, it was it was crazy. I did a whole video on it because there's a lot of history and backstory. It was the last section of the I-10. But there was communities there. There was houses and everything. And yeah. when we were doing this walk, the north side of the park to the south side, there's a part where you have to go over the highway and it's not capped. And what I did is I had people, because everyone was talking on this walk, and mm-hmm. we went across... And I didn't say anything until we got over and it got quiet again and you could hear people talking. Mm-hmm. I was like, I asked the group, I was like, did you guys notice anything? Did you guys notice that all the conversation started going away as soon as we stepped on this bridge? Yeah. And I was like. Because you can't hear anything. No, you, you could hear the community get killed. Just Yeah, yeah. You, that's all you can hear is all really the, the cars. All the conversation just went away. So. But I mean, even besides beyond that, like, mm-hmm. you know, you see houses that are adjacent there. You knew homes were in that area where the park now is. It's, it's so it's heartbreaking to see before and after photos. Yeah. Have you ever formed lasting friendships or collaborations with people you met while exploring the cities? Yeah, of course. My cohort and I were very close in grad school, and I'm still connected to a lot of them um, because we like to kind of help each other and just like be able to ask each other questions. And then I've made some strong connections to some friends in uh, like federal jobs through conferences. And I also have someone that like I kind of joke around that she's my uh, mentor. Her name is Lainey Corey. And we're uh, going to try to get her on too. Yeah. Gonna... <laughs> Hi, Lainey. She was really helpful to me, like out of time researching what urban planning was because, again, um, a lot of people. People don't know what that is when you initially say it to them. And so before I applied for grad school, I was like researching really hardcore. And she was like very helpful in answering questions about the MUEP program at ASU, just any questions in general. So that was started off as more of a like a professional relationship where she was really helpful to now a friendship. And I think I actually when I think I met you both you and Lainey at the same time for the first time. Yeah. Planning Association. So ASU had its own planning association. I yes. Think. I was planning. I was hosting like monthly walks and I think you guys got inspired by that. Yeah. And then hosted your own walk. Yeah. And then I ended up that's how I met you guys yeah, as well. Yeah, love a good walk. That's walks, a good safe walk. A good that. safe walk, yes. It was in downtown Mesa, which is just made doing such oh, yeah, incredible. Yeah, I do remember that one. Yeah. We took a photo at the end. But yeah, that was the first time I met you. I met Lainey and Suppose I was supposed to meet Skitch the first time there Aww. too, but she was out sick. But and that's actually another friend that I formed through this. So Skitch was actually in my cohort in grad school. Yeah, I've just remained maintained a lot of friendships from that cohort. And I think that just shows one way you can build community is just just walking with a group. Like it's incredible. Yeah. And speaking of building connections and community, what are some ways you've been able to build connections in your own community? And I I know that was one example, but I'm sure you have more. Yeah, um, I think that I'm making those connections now, like through organizations like Urban Phoenix Project. And then there's also like Keep uh, Tempe Beautiful and a lot of other similar movements like that. I would also like encourage others to just get involved with other volunteer organizations that they're passionate about. So it doesn't have to be something just like very specific to your niche in planning, but just like anything that you're passionate about. So for an example, like waste management, I really, I really like that. So just finding groups like that, or just I have um, interest in water management and then interest in emergency management and just getting involved with side organizations that, you know, give you information about things like that or any kind of work organizations that, like for an example, I, I'm interested in uh, joined one that talks about urban stormwater infrastructure. And it's just a group where we get together and we kind of talk about like um, ways that you can uh, implement rainwater and storm infrastructure in commercial and residential spaces. And it just kind of bridges that gap between like professionals and community members that are just like interested. Yeah, there are so many stakeholders and people in your community that you probably, if you just go on Google, type the name of your city and just... Type, literally type in urbanism, you might get some stuff up, but bigger organizations like Keep Insert City Beautiful. Yeah. Most most cities have it or some tree organization and a lot of them will have common uh, goals and visions in the city. Yeah. Awesome. So you are a real planner. That is a real job. <laughs> city is. planner, urban planner. What is a typical day like for you as a city planner? Lots of meetings sometimes. Um, I attend a weekly internal meeting where we just review um, applications with other disciplines. There are some meetings just to keep up 
on the legislative changes and processes, you know, just to make sure that we're in compliance with uh, state legislation, complete reviews on my projects. I sometimes meet with applicants in person. I do presentations sometimes to commissions, uh, depending on the type of project. And then I also get to engage with the public on inquiries through Planner of the Day. What is Planner of the Day? Could you actually (laughs) explain? Our audience might not know what Planner of the Day is. Yeah, so it's different for every city. In the city I work for, Planner of the Day is when you're the first point of contact for people who come to the planning counter or if they call in and they just have any kind of questions about a potential development or just any questions about what can or can't be done on land. You literally never know what question that you're going to be asked. Um, And so in that way, sometimes it can kind of feel a little bit like a baptism by fire. It's the best way to learn. Sometimes it can be busy it really just depends on your staffing but I think my job does a pretty good job of like making sure that we equally divide up that responsibility so that we're able to get work done a lot of urbanists who are excited about cities go into planning without fully understanding the expectation of a planner what is the reality of being a planner and could you also talk about other career paths planners can pursue in both public and private sector I would first recommend internships just to get an idea of the work environment and like what fits for you. Before my first job, I figured more of my job would be like in the public sector, at least it would be reviewing projects rather than like creating the developments um, because that that would be in the public sector sector and that's true for the most part but it really just depends on the city because depending on how big or small the city is you might have a very specific job or you might get something that gives you a couple different hats that you can wear so I definitely recommend internships and then so far like I find the work to be rewarding it does have a great responsibility because it involves like balancing complex and often like competing interests to shape the Uh, developed area. As an urban planner, you can stay in planning and get specialized in something like housing or transit or economic development, or you can pivot to like federal jobs and then, you know, review funding for like for regional projects. You could also pivot to the private sector and work in like design or focus on um, GIS, which is geographical information sciences. If you want to focus on like geography or urban planning, you could also pivot into, pivot into adjacent industries like construction or just anything that like just thinking of any other fields that we work with, like you could kind of pivot into those for into those fields. So planning is kind of niche in a way, but then there are different aspects of planning. And then there are also adjacent professions that you can also go into. Yeah, there is so much. It, it, it's very multidisciplinary. For sure. It, there's just so many opportunities. There's a lot of organizations on the back end that a lot of people aren't aware of. There's a lot of advocacy that goes into urban planning too. So if maybe you're very passionate about accessibility, you can see if there's an organization in your community and you can get involved in you know, that's still urbanism. It's just people don't think planning and they think yeah. like these nonprofit organizations, they do a lot of great work. I know AARP does a lot of great work. Yeah, I was surprised by that one, too. Yeah, I was very surprised. And they do grants every year. I think, didn't AARP sponsor the grants when it came to, um, like, uh, some type of grant program with uh, the ADUs? I think they played a part in that. I'm not sure with with that, but I know they do, like, walk audits and, like, you could help get, like, infrastructure in your neighborhood. Because they're really big on accessibility and making sure people of all ages can walk and bike safely in their in their neighborhood. Yeah, you never know like what kind of jobs uh, where they'll take you and like what you can do with your planning experience. How can you as a city planner effectively advocate for a better city design and more sustainable urban practices while with working within the constraints of a municipal government? So if you get fortunate enough, I would recommend start by choosing jobs that align with your values. One way that I find that I can make a difference is just by making like comments on uh, design and intent, allowing some of the applicants to get creative when it comes to like their architecture or landscape, but also by encouraging like energy efficient designs that also meet the um, goals or like the intent of like our general plan or like sometimes character area plans. Some of my recommendations can just be as, as small as like suggesting exterior materials like certain paint colors um, just to d- like deter from heat gain. If you're depending on like if you're doing landscape review, sometimes you can make recommendations of like ground cover with like a wider vegetative spread and that just kind of helps again with heat mitigation. So you may not be able to change everything immediately, but you can sometimes make suggestions through your reviews that ultimately help meet like the greater goals of the community itself. And I think from someone that is very involved in the community, it's very helpful when the community is very supportive of things too. Yeah. 
looking to like the community's goals. So like a big issue here in Phoenix is heat. And so keeping that in mind when you're looking over like architectural or like design reviews, or if you're a part of creating those things, like creating that with those things in mind. So again, we don't, we may not have the power to be like the rule maker, but we can use a little bit of that agency in our reviews as the people creating these plans or even reviewing the plans. Yeah. And I think something interesting, like from a development perspective is like when you're developing like a block or a piece of land, you have to, at least in Phoenix, I think actually even in London, this was an issue because of how they built the skyscraper. But you can have reflection from the windows burn plants if you don't like have them correctly done. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe that because I used to work in a building, a very, it's, it was a glass building, the author Frio Solato. During the daytime, I was blinded walking through there. And I definitely can see how like plants, because I mean, if I was, if I was burning up, I could only imagine the poor plants. What advice would you give someone interested in exploring a career as a city planner? I've got a couple tips. So number one, just educate yourself on what planning is. Know what in urban planning interests you. And that will help you find your niche and what it is that you want to do. When you truly understand what planning is, then you know if it is something that you really want to do. My second recommendation is to do as many internships as you can so you can have an idea of like what type of work environment and like what you what it is that you want to do in your work and your day to day can shadow someone in that role. A third suggestion that I have is celebrating the little wins and the ways that you can bring about change. I was just mentioning how you can make recommendations in some of your re reviews or even just being on the other side of it where you're creating these plans, getting creative in those ways and finding ways that you can bring about change to meet the broader goals of the project or in this case, maybe the community itself. Another one would be to just gain a general understanding of how your role interacts with adjacent professions like engineers, architects, um, and just city management like from a budget standpoint so just kind of um, knowing how planning kind of fits into that puzzle fifth one would be to network because you never know who's going to have the same passions as you or know someone who might be able to plug you into something extracurricular like an organization or someone that they know i always tell people to stay curious and remember quality over quantity of connections it's not about making so many different connections but it's about making like meaningful connections and being able to build a relationship with someone i definitely think that like staying connected to different people in the in your profession helps the outlook on uh, helps you keep a bright a bright outlook because then you know that there are other people that are also have the same interest and are kind of trying to achieve the same goals as you and then my last one which honestly should have been my first one is to be very easy on yourself in planning because when you come in if you're coming in with no experience like I was it is a little bit of a steep learning curve there's always a lot to learn and in planning they say that you're a master of few maybe jack of all trades like you hold a lot of hats and you kind of have to know a lot of different things and it can be hard for people I mean sometimes grad school or even one job doesn't really teach it teach you all so always just like give yourself a little bit of grace because there's a lot to learn Yes, a lot of codes, a lot of zoning. Yeah, yeah a, lot a lot of, of stakeholders. Yep, yeah, that um, just a lot of different terms, a lot. All right, we're getting close to the end here, so I want to ask you a question. If you could redesign a part of Phoenix to better align with your vision of a vibrant, people-centered city, what changes would you make? Me personally, I would invest more in art and culture that's significant to Arizona. In the Southwest, we have like the great culture of like a lot of Chicano culture and a lot of indigenous culture here. And there's a lot to learn from a lot that will provide a lot of context on things. Like for an example, I'm sorry if I butcher the naming of this museum, but it's Va'akai Museum. It's also formerly known as the Pueblo Grande Museum. It's near the airport and they actually have dwellings on site. I think, I believe they're like the original dwellings that are on site and they're built right next to the canals and they were built by the Hohokam people that were here where a lot of settlements came in. It just kind of explains like the canals and it kind of gives you a little bit of a story behind the canal. But a lot of the things that people that I've noticed folks mention in Phoenix in general is that there's kind of like a lack of culture here. And I've noticed that like when I go to other cities and, you know, there are a lot of historic buildings and they're just kind of stories behind why a neighborhood has developed a certain way. And I think that's a little bit of something that we are missing, but it's not something that we are lacking. We do have culture here. I think it's just lacking a uh, presence and ways that it can be shown in a city as an amenity to help visitors learn about it. But then also people who are from Arizona live in Arizona to learn about their city. Yeah. And there is a lot of history. And I, like people just don't know about it. Like where our airport was built, there was a lot of the neighborhoods that were called barrios. A lot of the Latino communities mm -hmm. were 
essentially forced in that area yeah. because of just deed restrictions, Yeah, which... I, I'm i like a big nerd when it comes to the Phoenix story maps. I love them so much. And I could you can scroll them honestly for days. They have a lot of information on the African-American, the Latino, and the Asian-American history in the state of Arizona. And it tells you a lot of the stories behind uh, a lot of those deed restrictions, the redlining map, why things are certain places. Specifically, it, it has addresses in the story maps that kind of lead you to buildings that are existing or where buildings used to be. And so... Th- like I said, we're not, it's not um, a matter of lacking. I think it's just, or lacking like the culture itself. I think it's just a matter of like representation and like showing the art in our city and showing like these different things to bring a little bit of a culture to Arizona. Yeah. I, and one of the neighborhoods nearby to East Lake Park. Love East Lake Park. Is, is an Lots amazing. Lots of history there. There is. And there's no lake there. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason it was called East Lake Park was originally they would divert the canal water from the Rio Salado, which is. Phoenix did have a river. It was. It is now dammed up. But yeah, mm. there was a like a flowing river before everything got dammed up. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Hayden Ferry, which is in Tempe. Yes. That was actually a ferry company that would bring you back and forth because of the river. Okay, that makes sense. I've seen old maps, but and now that I guess that does make sense. Rose, it goes all the way to Roosevelt Dam, which is a way couple, back east. Yeah, way back east. It it is. It's known as Roosevelt Lake, but before it was a lake, it was. Not a lake. It, they they right. dammed it up to create. Most of the lakes in Arizona are man-made lakes. Like yeah, lake they're all Pleasant. dammed up to like a really big one and then made into smaller ones, which flows into Salt River, also known as Tempe Town Lake, and kind of stops at a point. But sometimes, like I believe in 2020, when we had heavy rains from the uh, what are they, atmospheric rivers in, in California, the like all of our lake it, levels, they kind of went up and you started to see water in parts of Salt River that were typically dry throughout the year. It was pretty nice. And we have beavers on there too. There's beavers that I, yeah. I heard this is the second time no, I've heard about there's these beavers. There's even a statue somewhere on the salt on the, the salt uh, really? river. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, no. No, it's 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 a great river. It they're doing a bridge right now to kind of honor that and bring that culture. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been attending some of those meetings and some things like I bring up is that culture. Like I like tell the story of the people that got displaced in this area. Yeah, the names or like even the stories behind the names of the park. I didn't know that. I, I've read the story maps a lot of times and I never really thought to like, why is it called East Lake? There's not a lake here. Um, but again, telling the stories behind those things or um, like the stories behind the neighborhoods. The old, yeah. So it's like the old aerial maps of like the Phoenix downtown area. You will see a canal that goes through mm-hmm. the downtown area. because so they used to divert the canal water mm. to downtown. Yeah, you'll have to show me these maps. Yeah, it's really cool. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to discuss or highlight about you? Not really, but thank you so much for the opportunity. Awesome. And is there any current project, initiatives, or organizations that you would like to share? And how can our listeners get more or support you or the organizations? I'd like to shout out, honestly, the Urban Phoenix Project. Uh, urban phoenix project anything that they do like definitely follow them um and then i'd also i'll shout out my insta my uh, planning instagram page it's wit takes the city I'm trying to get a little bit more active on there but if you would like to connect with me that's the best way awesome and i'll throw the urban phoenix project on the, yeah. the blog if i didn't i forgot to mention it in the beginning but if you haven't you can check our blog uh, it'll have Shameless links to, plug. I know, we'll have all the information that we've been talking about today yeah. So awesome. Thank you for coming down here today, Whitney. Of course. Appreciate Thanks for it. having me.